All right. We got Michael Chasen, graduate of uh, Georgetown Business School here and founder of Blackboard, and he's going to tell you about himself. Great. Thank you very much, uh, Evan. And uh, I'm very excited to be here. Uh, as, as Evan mentioned, not only am I a graduate student of the Georgetown MBA program, uh, our building was not quite as nice. So uh, when Georgetown uh, MBA program started, they just found like the nicest attic and they put us like in the top of that uh, while we were uh, while we were here for a couple of years and finally moving us to the car barn and then uh, now you guys have such a such a wonderful uh, place to learn but uh, uh, actually it was uh, a lot of my experiences that I actually had here at the Georgia M MBA program were formative in my starting Blackboard and in fact actually the genesis of Blackboard actually came out of my entrepreneurship class here at the MBA program. So what I thought I would actually do today uh, is first just very quickly tell you a little bit more about my background and myself and a few of thing, the things that I learned when uh, starting and growing uh, my own company, Blackboard. And the, the most interesting thing that I'm going to share is that the lessons I learned, uh, these, these five uh, key pieces of wisdom as I call them, were things that I ended up learning in the very first year of starting Blackboard. And yet there were lessons that continued to repeat themselves over and over again every single day. And so what I thought I would do is share them with all of you so that way you guys don't have to create your own $2 billion companies. You could totally just skip that since I will have told you everything you needed to know. Now to give you a little bit more background on myself, uh, I've been in DC for a while. I got my undergraduate degree in computer science from American University. I then graduated, went right into the Georgetown MBA program, concentrated in accounting and finance, although entrepreneurship was my favorite class. Uh, then ended up going to law school and then took a break about halfway through law school to get a job working for KPMG Pete Marwick. This was one, they were one of the big accounting consulting firms. Uh, and I was working their higher ed consulting group. And we saw that schools were spending millions of dollars wiring the dorm room and the classroom to the internet, but there was no software that made that useful for teaching and learning. So what we decided to do was to quit our jobs to design software that would let schools put their teaching and learning online. Now, this was just before the, the first big dot-com bubble. So when I was quitting my job, it was still stupid to do so. Um, uh, in fact, I literally, we had this idea of, of Blackboard, and I had been working at KPMG Pete Morwick just shy two weeks of my one-year anniversary. And I'm like, look, I'm like, literally, we're just going to wait two weeks. We just sat around so I could quit like after that. So I quit like two days later just so I could make sure on my resume, just in case this whole thing went south, I had at least one year work experience somewhere. Um, and, and, and just to tell you kind of the, the situation, um, uh, we, we quit our jobs. We uh, got a brownstone in downtown DC and my friends and I just started showing up without any clue of really what to do. Started working on both our business plan, designing software, and talking to everybody we could about our idea that the internet could be used for teaching and learning. And uh, from there, had an opportunity to, to help create and, and build a great company. So uh, we started back in 1997. And so I had uh, left work with uh, a, a, a good friend of mine, Matt Patinsky, who I was working with there. And he is actually one of my roommates from college as well. And uh, we came across a group of students at Cornell University that had already developed some tools that teachers were using to put their classes online. And they were just about to graduate. So we said, oh, well, we should combine forces because we have management experience because we had been working for one year and a great name, Blackboard. And they had some software that was being built and already used by schools. So we very quickly combined together and uh, brought to market the very first uh, course management system or e-learning system, uh, Blackboard Learn, in 1998. And in fact, Georgetown was actually an early adopter of that technology. Uh, and, and then the, the bubble hit. I mean, there was huge amounts of investment going on. Everybody was starting to adopt internet technology. Uh, we had, uh, suddenly we went from a handful of schools to a dozen schools to several dozen schools to 100 schools to 400 to 500 to over 1,000 schools using our technology. We were doing so well, we were able to raise additional capital. We ended up acquiring many of our competitors. So if you went to an undergraduate school that used WebCT or Angel Learning or, or Edline or even the open source solution Moodle, Blackboard is actually... Uh, owns all of those brands and learning systems as well. And then we started expanding beyond just putting teaching and learning online. We wanted to help put all of education online. So we ended up either building new technologies or acquiring things. Uh, you know your, uh, your Georgetown student ID cards that you used to get around campus, your parents could put money on those. 
Uh, Blackboard's the number two provider of those type of solutions around school. Um, if you have uh, younger brothers or sisters and your parents get a phone call when there's a snow day or because uh, you, you know someone whose uh, kids get tardy to campus, they get a call. Blackboard provides the telecommunications, email, and text messaging system for about three-fourths of the K-12 through schools in the United States to do mass message outreach when there's an emergency or, or a snow day. Um, if you download Duke Mobile or Stanford Mobile, those mobile apps are all powered by Blackboard. So we started to bring to market an array of various technologies that schools could use to take advantage of the internet and how they were delivering education to their students. And today, Blackboard serves over 30,000 institutions around the world and 30 million users on a, on a daily basis. And hundreds of millions of students throughout the years have gone through and know the Blackboard name and Blackboard technology. And, and it was a great experience for me personally. I mean, we literally started in a brownstown, just two of us, in, in, in downtown DC, 19th and N Street. We, we, had, we had rented this two-room brownstone and just started showing up. And I had the opportunity to see Blackboard grow to an organization with over 3,000 people in 20 offices around the world. We started with just a small handful of clients, Georgetown, University of Pittsburgh, Cornell among them, ended up growing to these 30,000 institutions around the world that use our technology. What started with just a small group of entrepreneurs grew to this global company. And we had 500 people in sales and marketing. I had 400 developers working on our software, a consulting arm of over 200 people. We had eight data centers around the world, a 100-person mobile team, two call centers in the middle of Kentucky. A, 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 a big step forward from the day where I had one guy in charge of programming, one guy in charge of sales, and one guy in charge of marketing. And we grew from just a few thousand in revenue to a company that did over 650 million in revenue and 165 million in profit. So a lot of people say, you know, Mike, that's, that's so great. You got to see this company grow from a, a small private company to a company we took public in 2004, valued at $400 million. And then at the end of 2011, we sold it to a private equity firm for $1.7 billion. And people say, wow, with, with that kind of journey, how, how did you keep it all in perspective? How, how did you stay grounded? How did you really appreciate the, the, the changes of the organization over time and everything that you learned? And I would tell people that really, there were two things that helped me keep all this in perspective. One was my mom. I remember I called my mom up on the phone. I said, mom, can you believe it? My roommate from college, from American University, the two of us, we started this small company and we grew it to this global leader in e-learning. We are literally touching millions of students around the world. And when we started not even paying ourselves a paycheck, we just sold it for $1.7 billion. Can you believe that? And my mom said, son, that's great. But remember, you're not a doctor. <laughs> so, uh, Jewish mother. So, um, that, that certainly was one way that it, that, that, that it helped me keep grounded. But the, the, the other thing was that, um, the, the lessons I ended up learning along the way, many of which uh, happened actually within the first year of us creating this company, continued to repeat themselves and reinforce themselves over and over again. And, and let me share some of them with you. You know, a, 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 a lot of burdening entrepreneurs, they call me and they say, Michael, you know, I'm thinking of dropping out of school or I'm finishing up school and I, I'm deciding I'm putting off joining the workforce because I want to be an entrepreneur. You know, how, how do you decide what type of company to start? And I, I, I say, look, let me tell you the most important thing. You need to be passionate about what you do, even if others aren't. And, uh, and, 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 and let me explain. I mean, you know, uh, early on, um, when we first started to talk to venture capitalists, uh, I remember our very, um, one of our very earliest investors, Novak Biddle, they called us up one day. They said, you know, Michael, uh, we called a bunch of schools to ask them if they were ever going to use uh, the internet to put teaching and learning online. And uh, we called uh, a dozen schools. They all said no. They said, that's stupid. We have Luddite professors. They're never going to use technology to teach and learn online. So, of course, uh, you know, they said they would never buy your software. And that was actually feedback that we got early on from almost everybody we spoke to. But, of course, to us, that was you know, feedback we wanted to take in. And, and, and we knew that those were issues we would have to overcome. But we, we knew that everything was moving this direction. So this would be opportunity. But, but having negative feedback like that didn't just stop. Um, when we were a startup. Uh, you know, one of the great things about being CEO of Blackboard is people would actually reach out to me directly. This was the email I got. I uh, sent it to the CEO inbox, CEO of Blackboard.com from Dr. Betty Schiffman. Uh, the subject was Blackboard Learn Release 9.1 Feedback. 
So this is a teacher reaching out to me, and it was great. Sure, I found Blackboard Learn Release 9.1 to be a lot easier to work with, much more intuitive. I think there's a perception that managing an online course takes a lot of work, but the reality is that instructor is just so much more efficient. They now have the tools to help us manage assignments, tests, grading, etc. Signed, Dr. Betty Schiffman, Associate Professor at Jefferson Community Technical College. And that was great. You know, that's the reason why we created Blackboard in the first place. We were passionate about education, passionate about technology. We wanted to make a difference. And so when I'd get letters like this, uh, it, would, it would warm my heart and I would know that we would be in the right direction. But faculty weren't the only people that reached out to us. I got emails like this um, from a student. This was sent to the CEO of Blackboard.com inbox from BlackboardSucks326 at gmail.com. Subject, thanks for nothing. Uh, Dear Blackboard CEO, I feel that I must tell you that your software is ruining the educational experience that students are supposed to have in college. With your built-in plagiarism detection, it's as if the teachers no longer trust the students' work. With all the tracking built into the system, the teachers can tell exactly when we've read the assignments. Thanks for helping take the fun out of college. <laughs> now, I don't know what, what bothered me more here. The fact that someone took the time to tell me that I'm literally helping take the fun out of college. Or the fact that apparently Blackboard Sucks 1 through Blackboard Sucks 325 are all taken. Like, I didn't know which of those two were actually worse. But even getting feedback like this from the students, we would take this and incorporate it into uh, some of our own analysis of the direction the product should go. We said, okay, you know what? Well, now we're selling to the schools, but obviously maybe we haven't really improved the classroom for the students. And we took this and made sure that in subsequent releases of our software, we really started to incorporate more social tools, and other tools for the students to be more engaged and improve the teaching and learning, not just from the teacher's perspective, but from the students as well. So when I talk about being passionate about what you do, you have to be passionate, even in the face of constant opposition or people that may not like your ideas up front, and, and don't, not just be defensive about it, but be able to take that and help that guide the direction that you head in. Something else that I learned early on was how important it was to focus on the business and, and, and not the office. And, and let me share with you in a little bit more detail what this means. So as I said, I was working at KPMG Pete Mark. It's one of those big accounting consulting firms. It was, the offices were down on 20th and M Street. Huge brick building, thousands of employees. When we told my boss, the partner in charge of the higher ed technology consulting group that we were leaving, I, I, you know, he, he was a, a good friend and a personal mentor to me. He said, Michael, you know what? I wish I could go with you. I consider myself an entrepreneur. I want to support you and Matthew. So I'll tell you what, I know it's hard to start a company. You could take your computers, we had desktop computers at the time, you could take your computers, borrow them for a couple of weeks or months. That's fine, you know, give them back you know, when, you, when you can afford your own, but that's how I want to help support you, and good luck. So I remember that the day that we left KPMG, we, we put these computers on these chairs and we're just wheeling them out of the, the building. And I remember, of course, the security guards at the end of the building, they stopped us. Like, what are you doing? You can't just be wheeling computers out of here. We showed them, we had a note from, my boss that said we could take the computers. He, he called them up, yeah, apparently had a rotary phone, he called them up <laughs> and uh, verified that uh, indeed we had permission. He then took all of our driver's licenses and photocopied them and then wrote down the serial number of all the computers and that was fine because we weren't stealing the computers, we had permission. We were stealing the chairs. Now, <laughs> we got six chairs out of KPMG P. Mark that day. And the reason that that is important for those of you that haven't yet started your own company, chairs are expensive. I mean, between the two of us, we had about $1,000 in our bank account, which would have allowed us to buy three chairs with no uh, tables or computers to even, even put them at. Um, uh, to be honest, I'd like to lie to you right now and tell you that like, we got these like, nice like, carbon carbon chairs and you know, they were terrific. So th this was the chair that I, that I stole. So um, <laughs> it doesn't uh, go up or down. You can't tell from this picture, but it's missing the plastic coating on this arm. And uh, it's uh, the chair that I still sit in today, uh, probably the reason why I have chronic back problems. But the reason that I, I, I have a chair that I stole 15 years ago, and it was easily 15 years old when we took it, um, is because it actually constantly reminds us how what's important about the business was the idea that we were trying to create, this technology that'll change teaching and learning, and, and not so much the, the office that you build around that. And, uh, and it became abundantly clear. So shortly after we had started Blackboard, I remember there were startups popping up everywhere as the big dot-com bubble hit the East Coast. And people would raise 20 million in financing, and they would build out these huge offices with all of these giant cubes, and they would be all set up for the massive employees that were gonna come but they never really found a business model that would actually support their company in the first place. So when you talk about these kind
kind of flash in the pan, quick dot com companies versus creating a company that, that really has staying power, to me it's, a, it's an idea of the focus and how important it is to focus on the business and the business model and, and that becomes more important than everything else uh, 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 around it, less so. One of the other things that I learned very early on, and especially when you're out there talking about raising money for your company and, and pitching your company, is how important it is to share the vision and sell the execution. Um, you know, uh, one of the early investors in, in Blackboard was Carlyle Group. You may have heard of them. They're one of the big private equity firms that specializes in defense contracting. But now, during the first dot-com boom, everybody was getting involved in early stage investing companies. So we were actually one of Carlyle's first early stage startups that they wanted to invest in. And as an early stage startup, I got to go to their annual CEO meeting. It was in Napa Valley. It was incredible. I flew down there and, and I was there and um, we were all sitting in a room. And I, I was by far the youngest. I was, I was like probably 25, 26 years old. Everyone else was, was, was north of 50. I was not dressed even as nicely as I am today. Everybody else was in suits. Um, like George Bush was there, Jim Baker was there. I mean, some incredible people. We're all in a room. And to kick off, we're all going around and. Uh, introducing ourselves. And I actually remember the very first guy stood up. He said, oh, I uh, run this defense contracting firm. Um, and this was actually during the first Iraq war. He says, you know those uh, missiles we're dropping on Iraq? Uh, my firm makes the missile casings uh, for those missiles. Second guy stands up and says, oh, you know how now um, the missiles, you can actually literally guide them. And there was a, a famous video where a missile like, flew into a house through a window and then blew up. Uh, the, the house. Well, we make the guidance system that allow the missiles to literally fly right into the designated target through a window and, and blow up the target. Third guy stood up and said, you know how you were able to watch that missile with the guidance? We make the video cameras for the missiles that we're dropping on Iraq to blow up the targets. And, and I stood up, I said, uh, hello, my name is Michael Chasen. I'm the CEO of Blackboard. Uh, we make technology that lets you put courses online. I think I'm in the wrong room. And I then spent the rest of the time wondering what am I going to do here at this conference, surrounded by people that were obviously so entrenched in the military industrial complex and I'm someone that's selling educational software to schools, I don't play golf, I wasn't a big wine drinker. Um, but nonetheless, I was there for a few days so I went around to every single person I could, constantly saying, hi, my name is Michael Chasen, so, uh, running an e-learning company, hi, my name is Michael Chasen, let me tell you about our software. And we actually came across them and said, hey, you know what, could we use this for internal training? Uh, in fact, government regulations are changing so frequently, we want to keep our staff updated. We have 50,000 employees around the world. Can we use you for internal training? Then we had someone else and come up to us and say, hey, you know, we're closely uh, linked with uh, the armed forces. One of the problems we're having is we're deploying troops and we're taking people right out of college. Could they actually continue their education while they're in their field on Blackboard? It was following this conference that we ended up setting up the Blackboard Corporate Government Division, uh, a group that now makes probably pretty close to about 100 million in revenue, just supplying technology to companies that want to do internal training and that one in the, the US government who wants to continue to allow their students to get educated in the field. In fact, actually during the, uh, during the second Iraq invasion, interestingly enough, uh, um, besides the fact that a large portion of our military where they were in the field were able to continue their classes at their various colleges on Blackboard, a lot of the schools in the Middle East ended up shutting down that week, uh, but they actually were also continuing their classes on Blackboard. And all of that came from me just constantly sharing what we were doing to a group of people that I thought would have actually no interest or relation. And, and look, even, even the reason that I'm here, I, I mean, I always love sharing my story and connecting with other people who are in business schools and other entrepreneurs, but I actually just also love sharing the story and the vision because that is the way that you constantly sell and get people connected who can help you with your startup. Always talking about what you're doing and sharing the story. So one of the, one of the things that always stuck out to me, and, and it's fascinating because when you when you read TechCrunch, when you read about the success of Instagram or these other companies that are bought for billions of dollars and are incredibly successful, I know everybody here wishes, wow, maybe my idea can be that special idea. The truth is when you're creating a company, the game is a lot more like Monopoly and, and, a, lot like, and a lot less like winning the lottery. And, and, and let me explain that. You know, uh, I, I, I was on uh, stage one time, I, I was uh, invited by a university uh, getting an award for the way that we had helped out that school with their technology. And they said, uh, Blackboard was an overnight success. You, you've all heard of Blackboard. Isn't this great? Michael Chasen. And I got up and I said, Blackboard definitely was an overnight success. It was 2,555 nights. And that was just at our seven-year mark. 
we never thought Blackboard was an overnight success. I mean, every day we definitely felt we were taking like almost one step forward and slightly less than one step back, although there were some days we definitely were taking three or four steps back. Um, and when we started, we just felt though that at the end of the week, if we felt that we were ahead of where we began the week, then we were headed in the right direction. And it was just a very slow uphill climb. And the fascinating thing is that along the way we would see other companies come out, uh, one of our largest competitors, that was a large competitor for a, a week, we, we, we one day, we had never heard of this company, and suddenly we see a press release. A company that had investors including uh, Goldman Sachs and uh, uh, Michael Orbitz and a whole bunch of other hosts of top names had 400 schools using their platform and even listed some of our schools. And that actually therefore translated to millions, if not tens of millions of students. And we had never even heard of this company. And they had just done all this at an $800 million valuation. One of the schools they listed was Georgetown. We immediately called up Georgetown University. We said, we thought you're using Blackboard. Have you heard of this new technology? They, oh, so no, no, no. Um, that company just mailed us a CD of their software for free, along with the other 400 schools claimed that as their, therefore, potential install base. And we said, sure, send it to us, we'll look at it. But no, we've been using Blackboard for years. We're not planning on switching it out. Um, it was probably about a year or two later that that company went out of business and ended up selling the whole company for pretty close to a dollar. And these things would happen along the way. And every day, like, we'd, we'd hear some new exciting company that suddenly might be worth a billion dollars. And then shortly after, we'd be saying, like, what are we doing wrong? Why don't we have that type of huge success? And we would just hire another salesperson or sign up another one more school or two more schools very slowly. But then at the end of the day, those companies were gone. We had 30,000 institutions around the world, 3,000 employees, and a very deep level of trust and relationships with core clients around the world. Uh, you know, specifically, um, the things that come uh, to me when we talk about what were those items that kind of made up uh, that... Uh, <laughs> that, that overnight success over the, the seven years it took us from when we started to when we went public was, uh, you know, I, I talked about this a little bit, um, the, the difference about what the market said about us. So, as I mentioned, our very first venture capitalist investor called a bunch of schools and said, uh, are you going to install Blackboard? And they had all said no. And so, of course, therefore, there was no instant thinking that Blackboard was going to be a billion dollar company when no school said in the first place they were going to use our software. Uh, one of the ways that we actually got the schools to start using our software was we went to Georgetown, we went to University of Pittsburgh, we went to Cornell, and we said, look, we'll tell you what, we want you to be a first client. We'll customize our software to make sure it works with your school, and we're even going to give it to you for free. So for the first two or three schools, we actually gave our software away for them for free in return for being a great reference account. The next two to three schools, we went to them and said, you know what, we'd love to have your school using our technology. We'll be very hands-on, we'll work closely with you, and we're going to offer you a 75% discount. Then two more schools, we offered a 50% discount. And then finally, just as we were hitting school eight, we had our first full paying customer. But we also had eight great reference accounts. And we found that that model actually continued to work as we rolled out new pieces of software. So even though years later, when Blackboard was a very large global company, when we launched a new product, the first thing we did was find a handful of schools that were willing to take that product, promise to deploy it, work with us very closely to get the kinks out and be great reference accounts. Then we build that for our first few clients with huge, huge discounts before finally getting that very, very key client that paid full price. And that's how we were able to penetrate and scale uh, in these markets. And that is also, again, a little bit contrary to the idea of don't fail fast because that is a slow process. And that's why we needed venture capital money. We raised money because we wanted to be able to go to the schools and get our product working, then immediately go to schools and show that they would pay for something. But nonetheless, it wasn't something that we, if we blew up and ran out of money in two months, the company would not have succeeded at all. I mean, it actually took us years to become cash flow positive and then get to a point, but once we had, uh, we became a very profitable company. So the Blackboard business model was charge an annual subscription fee to the schools. We started with an annual $5,000 license to schools. Then we built up more technology and we upsold schools to so our enterprise version, which was around $25,000 a year. Then we built an add-on, a content system add-on, a community add-on. We acquired other companies, the Blackboard Transact system, the Blackboard Connect system, the Blackboard Mobile system. So then suddenly the average school was paying us $85,000 a year. We had some schools paying us over $200,000 a year. Even had a school now with a contract value of over a million dollars a year. But again, this was in year four, five, six of the company. Earlier on, we had to get those early clients at either free or that low price point, which is why it was seven years for us to get public and really I think you know, 15 years before we 
we were worth over a billion dollars. Now, all of that being said, and, and, and Evan knows this because uh, him and I have talked about it before, one of the giant benefits about being in DC is that uh, a lot of the, the problems in the US, and even global problems, are actually uh, you know, basically worked on or have policy uh, centers here in the DC area, and education is one of them. So if you're doing a company in education, in healthcare, in public policy, along a host of others, there is not a better place for you to do a startup. But these are not quick startups that fail fast or just suddenly after getting a million users, you're worth a billion dollars. These are startups about really uh, bringing new technology to market, making fundamental change, and building large successful businesses. Uh, and that's why I believe that both entrepreneurship here in the DC area really can affect world problems. And one of the reasons why we started education was we thought that that was a great problem that we wanted to try to address. And then the very last thing that uh, we realized that, uh, that we learned at Blackboard is that disruption changes everything and then it changes everything again. Uh, I, I don't need to go over how uh, music started by selling uh, records at Tower Records before allowing people to download stuff on Napster and now you can just get music right on your different uh, mobile devices or how television started with basic cable then you got video on demand and now again streaming right to your mobile device or how uh, the bookstore was replaced by Amazon online and then Amazon is actually replacing itself by digital books right to your mobile device but when you look at what's going to happen in education you have brick and mortar colleges uh, then online programs many of them powered by Blackboard but exactly what comes next you know, it still hasn't been determined. But I can tell you that Blackboard is spending a lot of time and putting a lot of thought behind what happens next. Uh, many of you may have heard of uh, MOOCs, these massive online open course environments. So they've finally taken technology and figured out how to put 10,000 students through a single class with the same infrastructure of a regular class of just one or two teachers and a few TAs. Now why is that important? Well, when you couple that with the fact that you can now get almost every textbook fully online, which means that content is truly portable, uh, and also the price of content is going down. What that means is that there's a whole class of people that haven't had access to higher education that for the first time can maybe engage in continuing their education process. I, I was visiting a, a, a president of a university in China and he took me around the campus and, and they were building tremendous buildings. And he said to me, Michael, you know what? Um, we have a huge amount of money, we're building a, a, a huge infrastructure here, but the truth is even if we had twice as much money, we're out of land, we can't build more buildings to get more students in the class. But by the way, even if we could get more students in the class, there are people that live seven hours outside of the city. They're working in the fields. They couldn't come in every day to class. So we're looking to put as much as our teaching and learning online as possible because all those people in the fields, they have cell phones. So if we can actually truly get our class online and the content can be distributed in a more modular, smaller fashion to the smartphones, then, and we can lower the price because you could have one teacher teaching so many either hundreds or thousands of students, then that can really change how education reaches the mass population and cause a fundamental change in education. And I think that's what's coming next. And that's Blackboard, I can tell you, is, is heavily involved in looking at that next level of transformation, really opening up higher education and continuing education to all the people that today can't afford it. So I, uh, I, I spoke briefly just about the things that I learned at Blackboard, how many of them uh, occurred first just in the startup year, but then continued to represent themselves over the years. Being passionate about what you do even if others aren't. Focusing on the business, not the office. Share the vision, sell the execution. Uh, the, game is not, the game is Monopoly, not the lottery. And I probably will get in trouble. See, I, I, I used to not be able to write Monopoly because I was trying to form a Monopoly, but I don't work for Blackboard anymore, so I can uh, say that the game is Monopoly. Uh, and then realizing that disruption changes everything, and then it changes everything again. But there is, there is one more thing that I learned. Uh, after doing all this. So as I said, in, uh, in the end of 2011, we sold the Blackboard to private equity firms. So that means they acquired all of our public company shares. Uh, and then they're sole owner of the company. And then a year later, I had the uh, opportunity to step back and, and retire uh, from the company. Uh, and then the lesson I learned at that point is when you're done, you do it all again. So I uh, took off a weekend. And um, then I was just kidding. I remember my, uh, my wife was saying, you know, oh, you're home now. You're really, uh, you've got to get out there, do something. You're driving me crazy. I said, honey, uh, first of all, it's Saturday. Uh, my last day was yesterday. I haven't even really done anything. Um, and, I, and I did another uh, startup, uh, Social Radar. Uh, we're focused on the mobile space, uh, inventing uh, new ways to apply location technology to your smartphone. Uh, doing everything from, so making it so when you walk into a room, you'd automatically know everybody else who was there, but also taking that technology and letting other people who want advanced location technology capabilities built into their apps uh, utilize that as well. Uh, and um, I can tell you I'm just as passionate about 
uh, you know, this new startup as I was my last one and, um, you know, continue to be passionate about entrepreneurship and making a difference. So, uh, with that, if you want to email me, you can, uh, if you have questions about my uh, presentation or just want to chit chat about your own entrepreneurial ventures, my email is Michael at Social Radar. You can follow me at Michael Chaser on Twitter. I'm, I'm quite witty online, I'm funnier online than in person. Follow me on Instagram or you can friend me on Facebook. Great. Thank you. <laughs>